My aim today is to try and explain what the internet computer fundamentally is and why um, people might want to use it. So I'm not going to go into the underlying tech. The underlying tech is pretty complex. Um, we have a uh, large team of uh, very senior research scientists and engineers um, distributed around the world. We've got a, a research center in Palo Alto and Zurich and people in places like even as far as as Japan. Um, and the project involves a lot of cryptography, distributed computing, virtual machines, um, language design, and so on. Um, and it's, it's complex. And uh, there's some information out there that people can uh, access if they, they want to um, do a deep dive into that. But what I wanted to do today was to communicate to you what the internet computer is fundamentally. So you go away, and when you hear the word internet computer in the future, um, you have a, a kind of fairly accurate picture in your mind. So uh, fittingly then, the first question uh, we're going to address is, what is the internet computer? So uh, we'll start off thinking uh, about what a computer really is. Um, you know, you can, you can define a computer mathematically, right? So a computer, in essence, is essentially a virtual thing. Um, so there were people like you know, Alan Turing and von Neumann um, that created mathematical models uh, describing how computers you know, process instructions and data, right? Um, and you can go from those kind of mathematical, theoretical um, models of what a computer is to a physical implementation. So most of us think about these physical implementations. Either it's a, a kind of server machine like this one, right, a physical computer, or it could be a laptop or a smartphone. What's interesting is that, you know, a computer can also be created um, from a network of computers. Uh, and that's what this thing is here. Um, that's actually a kind of recording of the Definity network or in, in, in some small configuration of Definity testnet. And you can see there are lots of these, these, these dots represent different computers that are connected together um, over the internet to produce one larger computer, right? So um, you may wonder who runs these computers. Um, for the most part, they'll be run by people we call miners. Now, in the context of Definity and the internet computer, miners are very, very different to Bitcoin or Ethereum miners, right? So in Bitcoin and Ethereum, miners just compete to solve these puzzles by brute force, which involves um, expending as much electricity as you can, right? And, and if you're the first to solve a puzzle, you get to, to add a new block to the blockchain and get some kind of reward. So Definity Mining is very different. Uh, you have to run uh, a computer that looks similar to a sort of mid to high end server machine. There are different hardware specifications possible that, that you can use. And uh, miners uh, will gain scale by running lots of these machines. So you know, we want the internet computer eventually to comprise you know, 50 to a, it, within a sort of 10 year window, 50 to, 50 to 100 million machines, right? So it's a really uh, aiming to produce a really massive kind of supercomputer for the internet that, that the world can kind of host its IT on. It's a very different thing. So why do people um, run these? Why do miners run these nodes? Well, of course, um, they earn tokens by doing so. So you can, um, you can imagine, for example, that a lot, there are a lot of uh, you know, traditional hosting centers around the world that have got empty rack space, right? And those guys might choose to fill their empty rack space with Definity mining nodes, um, so they can earn extra revenues. Um, but anyways, you know, uh, there's obviously a, a process involved to create a Definity mining node, and once you've got the thing up and running, it connects to the Definity network, and using the Definity protocols becomes part of the internet computer, right? Um, a key aspect of Definity um, is that it scales out its capacity, right? So um, that means new mining nodes can join the network to increase capacity, so you can install more software on it, run more computations, store more data. And you know, uh, a lot of people in blockchain talk about scalability. Um, Definity uh, isn't like pursuing a buzzword. Um, if you look back on, on, on the Wayback Machine, uh, you know, the Internet Archives, you'll see uh, on Definity.io, um, back in 2015, um, the project had already um, you know, um, amassed quite a substantial amount of research on 
ways to create a decentralized cloud. It's a very, very non-trivial task indeed. And um, uh, that's reflected by the kind of people we have on our team, which you can get, get on the website. So uh, next question, um, what kind of software will the internet computer run? The answer is universal software that runs anywhere. It's a thing called WebAssembly. Who here has heard about, heard about WebAssembly? OK, so it's good that you know, um, some of you heard about it. Um, everyone needs to hear about WebAssembly. Uh, it's going to be absolutely huge. So it's the first open standard for universal software that runs anywhere. You can think about it as a kind of Java that wasn't owned by some microsystems and now Oracle. But of course, you know, Java was designed, what, 25 years ago or something now, and WebAssembly incorporates all of the learnings that have happened since. It's a really fantastic system. Um, it's a virtual machine, so you can write your software in any language you like, potentially, and it will compile down to the WebAssembly uh, bytecode format and run on the WebAssembly virtual machine. The amazing thing is WebAssembly is already inside all of the major web browsers. So uh, we're looking at you know, mass adoption being a thing in the next five years. So that means if you want to right now, you can write WebAssembly software that runs at native speed inside of the web browser. That's not you know, something that's coming tomorrow. That's, that already exists. It's already there, actually. So um, you know, the world's slowly becoming aware of WebAssembly. And, and we think that it's not just, um, it, it won't just be on the front end that WebAssembly is important. It's also going to be very important on the back end. And Definity, uh, the internet computer, aims to provide that kind of back end. So if you like, you know, this is about creating an open standard for software that runs anywhere. And that'll be present in what already is present in all the major web browsers. And um, in, in the same way that you can you know, use this open standard to write software that will run anywhere, um, you can also um, use that open software to write backend systems that run on another open system, the internet computer, which is a public resource. right? So what we're trying to do um, is do for computation what the internet did for networking. right? That's why it's called the internet computer. Um, where did Definity come from? It's worth looking at this. So, uh, you know, we do have to trace our history through Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, you know, uh, Definity, I wouldn't define Definity as a blockchain project, although you get all of the properties of a blockchain. Um, but it's a decentralized computing network, for sure, and it's a special kind of decentralized computing network. So, what was remarkable, remarkable about Bitcoin wasn't that it was a decentralized network. We already had decentralized networks. We had BitTorrent, for example, right, for file sharing. What made Bitcoin different was that although it was a decentralized network, everybody um, could share a, con a, a consistent view of a state, in this case a ledger, right? When you went onto the, you know, the BitTorrent network, yeah, you could search for files and things like that. But you know, your interactions were kind of limited to whoever you were downloading a file from. The difference with Bitcoin was there was a shared state. And the shared state was a ledger, right? A very simple kind of spreadsheet with three columns. In the first column, you have address, right? Like a bank account. In the second column, you have a balance of Bitcoins at that address. And in the third column, you have an access control script. And if you can unlock the access control script on one of these rows, you can move the Bitcoins to a new address. Really a very simple thing. But what was so remarkable uh, about what Nakamoto did is that you know, no matter how big this you know, decentralized network became, everybody could uh, you know, share this view, shared the same view of this ledger. Right? So you know, if I um, transferred some Bitcoins to somebody, Everybody else would agree on the network that I also transferred those bitcoins to that person, right? And that was a remarkable advance because it was, you know, done in the absence of any kind of central controller. Um, Ethereum um, realized that the shared state, um, of this, you know, this shared state, this this shared ledger could be greatly improved upon, and Vitalik wanted to add an enormous amount of programmability. So he drew on uh, the existing concept of smart contracts. And now you could upload smart contracts to a decentralized network. 
and they could have functions and things like that. Essentially, they're software. And you can call those functions, and the smart contracts have state data associated with them. So we're sort of on the road, really, to what Definity is uh, trying to produce, which is an sort of internet supercomputer. So the difference between um, Ethereum and Definity is that Definity uh, uses a lot of new cryptography and other techniques to greatly improve performance, um, scale out capacity, uh, provide a much simpler programming model, um, which is based around this thing called WebAssembly, we just mentioned. And it also has a governance system. So it's not the code is law. So what is the purpose of the internet computer? OK, it runs, you know, it hosts and runs software and, right, that stores data and so on. That's kind of obviously useful. But uh, more specifically, you know, uh, we want to upload to cyberspace software, data, computation, and money, right? And it, and it is uploading it to cyberspace because, you know, um, yes, OK, it's the internet computer, but it, it's not really a com it com computer in the way that we conceive of a physical computer. It doesn't have a location. If somebody says to you, where is the internet computer? The only answer is cyberspace. The, in the internet computer is a virtual thing. And it's created by the interactions of all these other computers distributed around the world. So the internet computer doesn't have a geography. It doesn't, you can't say, oh, the internet computer is in Australia, or the internet computer is in Switzerland. No, the internet computer is in cyberspace. So there's this idea that you know, we can upload software and data and money and computation into cyberspace. Like the internet itself can uh, perform the role that you know, things like Amazon Web Services currently do. So um, we won't go through all of these things in detail because there's not that much time. But uh, we're going we're to focus on decentralized internet services. But just, just quickly, um, you know, uh, we can host private software systems. So uh, one of the reasons for doing that is uh, we can reduce the cost of R&D. We've got a new, new, new software development model. Right? And the systems on the internet computer can be hack-proof. Right? There's no like, back door into the internet computer. And we can uh, provide ways of preserving privacy using advanced cryptography. So you can put data in crypto lockboxes and things like that. So yeah, people, people, we hope, will build systems on the internet computer rather than using the traditional technology stack, which is you know, databases and web servers and middleware servers and firewalls and things like that. With the internet computer, you don't need all that stuff. Right? The, the, the platform's intrinsically secure. It's hack-proof. You don't need a firewall. Right? So, we hope that people will uh, you know, um, build their private systems on the internet computer. Uh, we also um, can support uh, decentralized business infrastructure. So you know, there are many industries in the world that want to create shared platforms. Uh, for example, to track the movements of goods and services and allow people to get financing for invoices and things like that. Um, or you, for example, in America, you can, ima you, know, you can imagine there's lots and lots of different medical companies companies, right? Massive medical corporations. And you know, medical patient information is uh, sort of spread, spread between them all. And it would be much better to have a single open platform where patient information was stored. Um, so we can support shared industry platforms. Uh, decentralized internet services, uh, where well, we'll look at a quick example. So this is where it gets really interesting. So these decentralized systems support a new kind of software called autonomous software. And that means the software can exist independently of some person or organization. So typically today, let's say you wanted to create a dating app. You would get a contract with Amazon Web Services, and you would install some, you know, you'd create your systems on EC2 instances or something like that. And you know, if you stop paying Amazon Web Services, all of those systems would just disappear, right? Pretty quickly, they'd turn off your servers. Um, and also, you know, you're subject to regulation and all kinds of things, and you control the data. You know that you control the data, and there are also problems with that. By the way, I mean, you know, there are there are hundreds of millions of users now of, of these uh, online, you know, or like dating apps, right? And we've all heard of Ashley Madison, but there hasn't been a really, you know, one of the big ones hasn't got hacked. But I think a lot of people are probably unaware that that's going to happen, or very likely to happen. You know, if one of these uh, big dating apps makes one misconfiguration error on their network, or they have one disgruntled employee, that's all it takes. And that huge database of chats, and, and hugely embarrassing chats, right, sometimes, is going to be on the internet. And um, you know, if you're unlucky, it'll just be there permanently for the lulls, and everyone will be able to sort of, you know, 
entertain themselves looking at each other's chats, or it'll, you know, the hacker will say, hey, you can delete your embarrassing chats for a Bitcoin or something like that. Um, but, you know, clearly that, that, that's an issue, right? That kind of thing is an issue. Um, so uh, imagine a different world where you can reinvent internet services uh, as open source businesses. And that means that you implement the internet service using autonomous software that runs independently of any person or organization. There's no Amazon, there's no account holder, there's no central server, right? And this autonomous software would have an in inbuilt, would inbuilt governance system. So you tokenize the service, and the governance system would be operated by uh, people, token holders, right? And via this governance system, the service would update its software and improve over time, right? In a kind of open source equivalent of the open source software develop development process, right? Except now the actual business itself is open source, right? And these systems can provide users with real guarantees about how their data is managed. So the internet computer will provide a kind of crypto lockbox um, technology that makes it possible for a system like a you know, dating app, which has all these embarrassing chats, that the, you know, the, where the creators of the content don't want their information shared widely. They can keep, the, the sensitive data can be kept in a crypto lockbox, right? Which is inaccessible to human beings, but which can still run software algorithms inside, right? So in the case of a dating app, you can imagine that you'd want algorithms to scan through the chat database looking for keywords so it can tag users and match them, right? So using this autonomous software, you can create an open source internet service where some of the data is actually protected by crypto lockbox functionality that guarantees it's inaccessible to human beings, but which allows software algorithms for example, that analyzes the content of the chats in order to match people can still run inside. So, um, you know, hopefully you can see that has a lot of potential. And I also believe that um, going forwards, once uh, these open computation platforms take root, um, entrepreneurs and innovators are going to want to build on them to avoid what's known as platform risk. Platform risk occurs when you build a startup on somebody else's API. I'll give you an example. It can even happen to big companies. If you think of Zynga, the social games company, um, they created this game called Farmville, like I'm sure most, most, most of you are aware of. And they grew and they IPO'd. I think they're worth about $5 billion. Going gangbusters. And then Facebook decided, hey, you know, I think we should change the way social games promote themselves, right? And the rug was just taken out from underneath Zinger. And, you know, they were a pretty powerful organization, you know, lots of investors worth billions of dollars, but they couldn't stop Facebook from pulling the rug from underneath them. And in Silicon Valley, this kind of thing goes on all the time. It's called platform risk, and VCs look out for it. Like, you know, hey, you're building on this other company's API. What, happen if, what happens if that company uh, removes the API? So recently, you know, a year ago or so, LinkedIn decided that it was going to remove access uh, to its APIs. Right, and um, you know, I think it was just Microsoft and Salesforce were left with access, and there are all kinds of companies that um, got wrong-footed by that. And, uh, so uh, I think that when we, when the decentralized internet takes off, we'll see kind of mutualized network effects where innovators and entrepreneurs will prefer to build on the open network and integrate with open source businesses because they provide much better guarantees. Um, a, about APIs and what happens to data and things like that. Um, so I think that's a pretty big use. Of course, the, the last use is decentralized finance. Um, things like ICOs, I mean, that's not what Definit is built for, but it's a, a sort of inevitability. But, you know, there are also uh, models for replicating things like commercial banking, you know, borrowing and lending, and uh, obviously prediction markets are a big one, insurance, token exchanges, that, that kind of thing. I think, as I mentioned, you know, a bunch of features, autonomous software, lower cost R&D, eternal execution. So on Definity, there's, there's no concept of storage APIs or anything like that. You just write software that runs forever. The platform is fundamentally hack-proof. You've got privacy protections. Lastly, um, you know, people often ask, how is the network controlled? If it's a truly open network, who controls it? Uh, the network actually uses uh, an algorithmic governance system. It's called the blockchain nervous system, um, which processes proposals. And this thing, it's a bit like a kind of operating system. It has privileged access to the network. So it's what you call a fully adaptive network. The 
um, protocol, the economics of the network, the network structure, which software can and can't run, all of these things um, are subject to the purview of the, 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 the blockchain uh, nervous system. It's essentially, you know, it's very, very simple. You create, uh, individuals can create neurons where they stake affinities to earn rewards for voting. And the voting power of a neuron is proportional to the number of affinities it's staked. Um, you can't get your affinities back without dissolving the neuron, which takes a year. Um, and you can configure your, your neuron to follow other neurons. And it, there's actually a, a bunch of content on, on the um, Definity Medium blog, if you're interested in it. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because this blockchain nervous system can de-anonymize software, potentially. De-anonymize data associated with software. Um, it can freeze um, miscreant systems. Now, a lot of people say, well, the code should be law. You shouldn't be able to freeze anything. Well, it, does that hold true for an ISIS slave market? Probably not. Um, so in the end, anyways, uh, this is the kind of uh, channel through which uh, the, 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 you know, the stakeholders uh, ultimately have their will um, pursued in, in, the, in the network. Uh, what is the network backed by? So there's a thing called the Definity Foundation. It's actually a not-for-profit. Uh, not it's headquartered in Switzerland, but we've got, um, uh, we, we've got our research centers around the world. It's a growing organization. Um, we're growing very, very quickly. So um, you know, we're trying to build out we, what we call a, a NASA for decentralization. So we're trying to build, you know, if, we believe if you, if you really want the internet computer to host millions of software systems, right, it's a huge responsibility. So it's unrealistic to expect, it's, it's you know, 50, 50 research scientists and engineers. There needs to be hundreds of research scientists and engineers behind something that's so important. And it's only when you have an organization of, that's sufficiently well-funded and has sufficient credibility and has the kind of expertise on board, you know, demonstrable expertise that we're ever going to see um, people really trusting a network like this to, 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 for mass adoption to, to occur. So uh, lastly, uh, there's, there are my details if you want to get in touch with me. Um, this here is actually a short video of the test network running um, inside of our Palo Alto headquarters. Um, it's actually, that was just got just shy of 400 computers in distributed around the world. Um, the, 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 they flash green when they um, uh, are chosen to collaborate, to produce the next random number, and uh, help create the next sort of piece of consensus. Um, but it's an interesting thing. There's like a paper actually on, on that particular process. Thanks very much.